Welcome to today's health talk. We will be speaking with Sarah Shaw um, about smoking cessation. Sarah graduated from Ohio University with a bachelor's degree in science, exercise science in 2003. She continued on at Ohio U to earn her master's degree in exercise physiology in 2004. She was hired at Altman Hospital in the fall of 2004 as an exercise physiologist in the cardiopulmonary rehabilitation department and eventually served as a department lead from 2012 to 2020. Her current role is the cardiac coordinator for the Altman Dubal Heart and Vascular Hospital. Uh, let's see, in 2008, she became a certified tobacco treatment specialist through the Breathing Association. It was near that time she assisted in starting the Give It Up Tobacco Cessation Program at Altman. She has coordinated this program from its inception and also acts as a facilitator for the group classes. Sarah is also a certified cardiac rehabilitation professional through the American Association of Cardiac and Pulmonary Rehab. Sarah, thank you so much for speaking today. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Sorry that was a mouthful of words, all those things. <laughs> but bottom line is um, today we're going to talk about um, quitting smoking, quitting tobacco use, and how that can be a critically important decision to improving your health. So um, today, kind of the agenda of what we're going to talk about, a little bit about why we smoke and how we develop our motivation to quit, um, how smoking can affect the human body, and we're going to talk about ways to develop a stop smoking plan and um, some of the obstacles that go along with those and how we can deal with those, what are the benefits of quitting, and how do we stay quit for good and prevent relapse. So. Why do we smoke? Um, we know that the addictive chemical in tobacco products is nicotine, and nicotine uh, opens up certain receptors in the brain that cause a physical dependence to uh, using your tobacco product, whether it's cigarettes or chewing tobacco or vaping. Um, the nicotine is the chemical that drives you to smoke. So uh, what happens is these, um, receptors bind the uh, nicotine. And once you have these nicotine receptors on your brain, they never go away. And when, they're, um, when you have the drug in your system, you, it binds to the receptors and it kind of makes them feel good and happy and they're contented. But the half-life of nicotine is about two hours. So after that time frame, um, some of those receptors will start to open up and they will start sending signals that tell you have a cigarette, have a cigarette. And the only way to get them to stop sending those signals is to have a cigarette. Once the nicotine's reintroduced into the brain, then it binds those receptors and it kind of shuts them off and you stop having those feelings of wanting a cigarette. Some people can train themselves to go longer than two hours, um, but uh, usually the, uh, the receptors will start at least sending those signals once the, the nicotine starts to wear off. Um, so that's the physical dependence. So it's actually like a scientific um, physical dependency that you feel that urge to smoke. It's not just willpower. Um, but there are psychological re reasons that can uh, also affect how much people smoke and their habits with it. Um, and a lot of people use smoking as a mood regulator. Um, it does give feelings of euphoria. So it can feel like it's helping you manage your stress. Um, it suppresses appetite, so a lot of people use it to help with weight control, and then often it's a, a social activity, um, you know, when you're drinking alcohol, that lowers your inhibitions, usually um, smoking cigarettes uh, pairs well with that, um, according to most research studies. So one of the first things you want to do is... Um, Determine, you know, what is your motivation to quit? Now, if you're probably listening to this and you're a smoker, you probably already have some motivation, but maybe you're listening to it for someone who is uh, a loved one or a friend that you'd like to help quit. 
and maybe they're still on the fence about whether or not they want to quit. One of the things we do with our patients is we try to help them develop this decisional balance. So they take a piece of paper, we cut it, we put it into four pieces. On the top of one corner, we write good things about smoking, then not so thing, good things about smoking, good things about quitting, and not so good things about quitting. So one of the first things you can do is start to explore your feelings and your ambivalence about quitting versus not quitting, and kind of take a look at your true feelings about smoking to kind of weigh those pros and cons for why maybe you've um, tried to quit or you haven't tried, um, what might be the barriers there. Um, another thing that we do is also called scaling, and that's to kind of start a conversation with our patients in terms of how important is it to quit smoking, how confident are you, and how ready are you, and kind of seeing based on how you rate yourself on, in these areas, um, kind of seeing what you would need to do to take the next step. So sometimes um, you can feel like that quitting smoking is extremely important, but that you're in a stage of you're not really that ready to quit and you're not really that confident of your ability to do that and exploring why that those factors um, might be. So just some quick facts that, um, uh, 434,000 people die every year from diseases caused by tobacco. Pack a day habit costs about $1,500 a year. And one drop of nicotine would kill an advertised person. It's actually a poison, um, but it's given in small amounts. So it doesn't um, do that right away. It's a, a long term, causes long term illness. So um, if I can get this video to play alongside this. Um, this talks about how cigarettes are manufactured. Nicotine may be the addictive product, but other cigarette components that accompany it are actually more lethal. So what's inside a U.S. blended cigarette? Tobaccos, flu-cured, burly, and oriental, only make up about half the cigarette. The rest is known as add-ons. One add-on, reconstituted tobacco, is made from a mixture of stripped stems, over or tobacco dust swept from the factory floor, and reclaim cigarettes that have passed their prime and have been sent back to the factory. It all goes into a giant vat. It's beat up. And as it's being beat up, it's constantly extracted like a tea bag. Well, that means I removed all of the chemicals, all the solubles, and then it's pooled into another vat. And this is a chemical reaction vat. The resulting solution is known as the mother liquor. So you have this mother liquor, which is an aqueous-based system, water-based system, in which now I can add a host of chemicals, diammonium phosphate, urea, ammonium hydroxide. And these, are, these additives in the recon are used to deal with nicotine manipulation. The others are thought to use as ameliorants. If you tried to smoke a cigarette without additives, it would be very harsh. How do I mellow that harshness out? How do I smooth it? Chocolate, butter fat, glycerol. Sounds a like, like things I buy in the grocery store, isn't it? Or foodstuffs. Well, they're actually added. Once chemically reacted, the mother liquor solution is applied to paper made from the ground stems, oval, and reclaim. This paper is dried and shredded and is known as reconstituted tobacco, or recon. It will make up 30% of the cigarette's contents. When it's smoked, the ammonia in the recon will enhance the absorption of nicotine in the smoker's body. And nicotine as it exists in the plant is sort of like a, a molecule with a ball and chain on it. And I want to free this molecule up by taking that ball and chain off. And now we start changing its shape, we call freebase nicotine. Freebasing nicotine is much the same as freebasing cocaine. Increases potency, increases delivery. Expanded tobacco, a puff tobacco product that has been expanded with carbon dioxide, is also part of the blend to act as a filler. So, in a finished cigarette, 20% is expanded tobacco, stems, and reclaim, tobacco from returned cigarettes, and 30% is recon. The other 50% is tobacco, which is also treated with sugars that mask the bitter taste of nicotine and enhance its absorption into a smoker's body. Tobacco, stems, reconstituted, reclaimed, and expanded tobacco are mixed in a bulking bin the size of a bus. 
It's all cut to 28th of an inch slices called rag and pneumatically moved to the cigarette fabrication side of the plant. There, the rag will be rolled in paper, glued, joined with filters made from cellulose acetate, and packaged. This process occurs at a rate of roughly 20,000 cigarettes per minute, sometimes 24 hours a day. Yeah, I do this. I, I guess that's what keeps me going. Yeah. I think we're back in business here. Um, all right, so I like to share that video because uh, I think it gives a little bit of an eye opener as to cigarettes aren't just uh, dried tobacco plants. Uh, they're specifically made uh, with a lot of different chemicals to um, enhance the addictive potential of the cigarette. And that's very purposeful on the part of the big tobacco manufacturers, which is part of what makes it so difficult to quit. Um, a cigarette, the nicotine from a cigarette reaches the human brain in seven seconds. And that's not by accident. It is because of um, the ammonia that's added to that mother liquor solution allows it to break the, what we call the blood brain barrier very quickly and cause that instant gratification, which makes it much more highly addictive um, than a lot of other drugs. Um, so just to quickly touch on um, smoking in your heart. So, one of the things that happens when we smoke cigarettes is that the chemicals that are in the cigarette actually damage the inner lining of the arteries. So our arteries are like a blood superhighway, and they have a very delicate inner layer called the intima. And the intima is lined with special cells called endothelial cells. These endothelial cells, um, when damaged, actually lose the special properties that allow them to be almost like a slip and slide or a Teflon coating. So when it's damaged, it's like a Teflon pan where um, instead of now everything slipping right off of it um, and now becomes very sticky in the area where the damage has occurred um, and it perpetuates the development of atherosclerosis or this um, the plaque that uh, can get stuck on the artery walls and creates that narrowing and eventually could cause a blockage that can lead to a heart attack. Um, we know that smoking is bad for your lungs. Um, it damages the airways and the air sacs of the lungs and the tar from the, the cigarettes actually paralyzes the cilia, which are kind of like the broom that sweeps the bad stuff out of the lungs. So when those are paralyzed, everything kind of sinks down deep into the lungs, keeps the lungs from cleaning themselves out. And over time, um, it's extremely damaging to the airways and to the very delicate um, uh, air sacs in the bottom of the lungs. Uh, smoking is also linked to a variety of other diseases, including cancer, emphysema, heart and vascular diseases, chronic bronchitis, sinusitis, amblyopia, premature aging, and stroke. And one of the things that um, we talk about with cigarettes is that it, they kind of have a free reign to go wherever they can in your body because carbon dioxide binds to um, the red blood cells. I think that is my next slide, actually. No, maybe not. So, um, Nick, uh, cigarettes contain uh, small levels of carbon monoxide, which is a poisonous gas that comes out of like uh, furnaces or um, you hear about it in car exhaust. And it's also in cigarettes in small amounts. And when you inhale that carbon monoxide, it actually is um, very much. Uh, attracted to our red blood cells. And it hitches a ride on what we call the hemoglobin attached to the red blood cells. And this is in place of oxygen. So when you smoke a cigarette, instead of having oxygen bound to the four hemoglobin on a red blood cell, you have some of those um, hemoglobin will now bind with carbon monoxide and that gets delivered all over the body. So um, like the number one cause of bladder cancer is smoking. And we can think back that it relates to the fact that these chemicals can kind of hitch a ride um, in the bloodstream and go um, anywhere in the body. So it's not just the heart and the lungs that can be affected by smoking. It can be lots of other areas. So when we talk about quitting smoking, one of the things we want to address is nicotine replacement therapy. We talked a little bit earlier about um, the physical addiction to nicotine and how we develop those nicotine receptors on the brain. They send the signals that makes it very difficult to quit because you kind of feel like constantly having this, have a cigarette, have a cigarette. And it um, especially gets very difficult 
in the early phases of quitting. So one of the things that's been developed to combat this is what we call nicotine replacement therapy. And that means this is like nicotine and other forms other than smoking it that would allow you to um, have a little bit of nicotine in your system, bind those receptors so that you didn't have those con that constant feeling of you need to smoke and you can foc a little, focus a little bit more on the behavioral aspects of quitting. Um, it comes in different forms. The most common over-the-counter would be the patch, the gum, and the lozenge. The nose spray and the inhaler are um, prescription only. And then um, Wellbutrin is a medication that is actually prescribed for uh, depression, but has a side effect they found of helping people quit smoking. And um, it's marketed as a smoking cessation tool under the name Zyban. Um, but Wellbutrin or Bupropion is the other um, name for the drug. Um, and basically it helps people sort of feel like they lose their desire to smoke. And Wellbutrin can be used in combination with any of the other nicotine replacement therapies. Um, and so sometimes that combination therapy can work really well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the different types of nicotine replacement therapy um, that you can use. Uh, the patches are probably the most common one that people use. These are what we call long-acting nicotine replacement therapy, and um, you can buy them over the counter. Uh, they're time released over 24 hours, but they do take about 30 minutes to kick in. So if you're somebody who smokes first thing in the morning, like before your feet hit the floor, recommend setting an alarm um, about a half hour before you're going to get out of bed and put that patch on so that the, um, the patch has time to kick in. Also, it's better to start the process in the morning um, because you do wear it all the time and it can, sometimes can disrupt your sleep a little bit. You're not used to getting nicotine all the time, but you do need to wear the patch for 24 hours. Um, you use it in a step-down protocol to try to wean yourself off of smoking. Um, 21 milligrams is the highest prescribed and that's designed for somebody who smokes about a pack to a pack and a half a day. Um, you would do two to four weeks on 21 milligrams, then drop down to 14 and eventually seven. Um, if you smoked more than um, a pack and a half of cigarettes a day, so two packs or three packs, you can more, wear more than one patch at a time with guidance from your doctor. The FDA actually approves up to 63 milligrams of um, nicotine replacement in the form of the patch for people who might need it. So if you're wearing a 21 milligram patch, you smoke you know, maybe two packs of cigarettes a day and you still feel like you wanna smoke, um, it could be that you're not getting quite enough nicotine. Um, the one way to kind of see if that's true is if you um, are wearing the patch and you smoke a cigarette and it makes you feel better, like it relieves the craving, then it's, that means you're probably not getting enough nicotine. If you smoke uh, while you're wearing the patch and you feel sick, or like you're going to throw up, that means that you do, you didn't really need any more. You just were kind of driven to smoke, but it wasn't actually a physical need for any more nicotine. Um, the um, gum and the lozenges are both short-acting nicotine replacement therapy, and they're more um, designed to kind of use as you need them. They only take about five minutes to kick in. Um, if you're using the gum, it has to be chewed about three or four times and then parked between your gum and your lip for your body to absorb the nicotine in the gum. If you continually chew it, then you'll be swallowing most of that nicotine. It actually can cause stomach upset and um, you don't really absorb as much of the nicotine that way. So it definitely needs to be parked more like chewing tobacco. The same goes for the lozenges. You kind of have to get them a little bit wet and then you park them for about 20 minutes between your gum and your lip, kind of wet them again and park them again. Um, and kind of repeat that for up to two hours with one piece of gum or one lozenge. Um, it's self-regulated and it comes in two strengths, four milligrams and two milligrams. Um, the limit per day is uh, 16 pieces. Now you can use um, nicotine patches and nicotine gum together to help with breakthrough cravings. So you could wear the patch for 24 hours um, if you felt that urge to smoke, felt like you needed a little more nicotine, uh, you could use a piece of gum or a lozenge to kind of give you a little bit extra for those times when you had the cravings. Um, so that could be something that's helpful versus feeling like you're wearing the patch and you smoke a cigarette to help yourself feel better. Using the gum or the lozenge is a better alternative 
Um, you may not need to use very much, um, but would keep you from smoking at all. Um, the other short acting nicotine replacement therapies would be the nasal spray and the inhaler. I haven't known too many people to use the nose spray. Uh, the inhaler um, isn't inhaled into the lungs. It actually sprays nicotine on the back of the throat, and then it's absorbed um, through in the throat um, to uh, deal, help with the cravings for nicotine, but it is by prescription only. Um, like I talked about, bupropion is also known as Zyban or Wellbutrin, and it is an antidepressant uh, medication. Um, to start taking it, you can usually continue to smoke uh, during the first week, but then they try to encourage you to set a quit date sometime in the second week. And um, it does have some side effects, uh, but it also can help with um, people who are afraid of gaining weight when they quit smoking because it has a side effect of weight loss. So it can help sometimes with the, um, the worry about uh, excessive appetite and eating when you quit smoking. Um, Chantix is the only uh, prescription drug specifically marketed to help people quit smoking, and it's actually a nicotine receptor blocker. So it goes back to those nicotine receptors on the brain that we talked about before. It actually um, blocks those receptors from sending or receiving signals. So basically, you lose that desire to smoke. Um, and even if you did try to smoke a cigarette, people report you don't really get anything out of it. They don't recommend that you use nicotine replacement therapy with Chantix because the whole idea here is that it's blocking those nicotine receptors. So you really don't need to introduce any nicotine to the body um, because you're blocking the receptors. So it's had a fairly good success rate. There are some side effects, um, but uh, if there, you can tolerate some of those. Um, it has been seen to be a pretty effective way to quit smoking. I wanted to touch quickly on like e-cigarettes and vaping, which has become very popular, especially with uh, younger people. Uh, usually these um, are a, a liquid-based nicotine that comes in with a rechargeable battery. Um, the liquid is heated and uh, turns into a vapor that's then inhaled. And the reason that e-cigarettes aren't touted as a way to quit smoking is because they still contain high concentrations of nicotine. They're not regulated by the FDA. So even sometimes people say, oh, well, I have a liquid that doesn't have any nicotine in it. There's real no way to verify uh, whether that's true or not. And sometimes in some cases, um, the e-cigarettes the e or the, the vaping pens have higher concentrations of nicotine than even cigarettes and can create even um, a more profound addiction than just regular cigarettes because of how high the nicotine levels can be. So if you're interested in quitting smoking, the, the first thing we recommend doing is creating a stop smoking plan, um, picking a date in the near future. So if you find yourself feeling motivated to quit, you know, don't, don't wait for a month or two months to set that date. You know, do it within one to two weeks. Um, do some prep, but uh, also kind of get on the horse and, and give it a try. So um, after you pick your date, you want to decide which method you're going to use. Um, there's some different uh, methods that have been seen to work. Some people can quit cold turkey, which basically means that you are smoking one day and the next day you stop. That can be sometimes difficult. Um, you can do what we call a uh, tapering method, which means you try to cut the number of cigarettes that you smoke each day by a certain amount to get down to zero. And we recommend not doing like a... 20, 19, 18, 17 kind of thing, one cigarette a day, but kind of larger chunks, like three to five cigarettes less every day so that you can quit within a week's time frame from when, um, when you start the tapering process. The delay method is another means you could do. You can um, delay the time you smoke your first cigarette um, until you kind of make it all the way through the day without having one. Um, but in conjunction with using one of these methods, we also recommend um, using some, some type of nicotine replacement therapy, which sees uh, a higher level of success, um, which would include maybe nicotine patches or gum or some type of medication. Um, if you are interested in using something like Chantix or Wellbutrin, then you would need to make a doctor's appointment um, and pick up that prescription um, in conjunction with the quit date that you've chosen. Um, another idea would be to sign up for some type of a tobacco cessation 
um, group or class or see a, a counselor maybe that deals with addictions that can help uh, with the behavioral side of quitting. Um, prior to go, the quit date, um, it's a good idea to record your habits for a week so you kind of know what your triggers are and your barriers. Um, write down every cigarette you have, how you're feeling, what you're doing, so you can get a better idea of um, what might be the most difficult times of day, uh, which cigarettes are going to be the hardest ones to give up, um, so you can plan ahead for how to deal with those. Um, I also recommend a designated smoking area, which means that in the week or two weeks leading up to your quit date that you pick a place at your house that is the only place that you can smoke. So, um, you know, instead of smoking anywhere in the house, maybe you pick like a garage or a back porch um, or a room in your house. And uh, when you go there, the only thing that you can do is smoke. So you can't take your phone, you can't take anything to drink, nothing to read, no other people can go with you. It's just you and the cigarette. The idea there is trying to separate um, smoking from all the other things that you do. So there may be some strong associations between talking on the phone and uh, having a cigarette, driving in the car and having a cigarette, drinking a, um, a cup of coffee and having a cigarette. And so if you start to force yourself to only smoke and then do your other things, um, it can help start to break some of that association prior to quitting. The other thing we recommend is uh, having a non-smoking mantra. So get an index card and uh, write on there, I never wanna smoke again because, and kind of write the biggest motivators you have for quitting. And one of the reasons we recommend this is because there's gonna be tough times and it's nice to have something right there that you can pull out, read it 10 times before you try, decide to have that cigarette. Um, stay motivated, stay focused on why this is so important to you. Um, some of the biggest barriers that people see when they go to try to quit smoking are obviously withdrawal symptoms, um, psychological issues, you know, um, managing their stress, and then weight gain. So um, when you go through withdrawal, um, those are the, these are some of the symptoms that you can feel. And the most common part of withdrawal are those cravings that have to do with um, the nicotine receptor sending off those signals. You, you know, you are legitimately craving, feeling like you absolutely need a cigarette. And one of the things we recommend for cravings are what we call the four Ds. Um, deep breathe, drink water, do something else, and delay for 10 minutes. So most cravings only last about 10 to 20 minutes. So if you can get through that time frame, usually you'll kind of get a reprieve from those feelings. Um, taking nice deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth, about 10 of those can often um, make those cravings go away. Um, having water with you all the time and um, you know drinking a big glass of water before you have a cigarette. And then having like a to-do list of things that you could do instead of smoking. Um, maybe it's uh, stuff around the house, go for a walk, you know, um, go see a friend who doesn't smoke or um, you know, different things like that. Uh, clean out a desk drawer, um, go through some old pictures. Uh, just some ideas that you wrote down ahead of time of things you could do when you started to have a craving to kind of get you through that time frame. Some of the other um, major withdrawal symptoms include tension and irritability. You know, you definitely hear about that, that it's, um, you, you can be easily irritated or angered when you're trying to quit smoking. Um, lightheadedness and tingling sensation, those stem from increased oxygenation. So when you quit smoking, um, instead of having carbon monoxide introduced to your bloodstream and taking up some of the oxygen, your body starts getting full oxygen. And if you've been a smoker for a long time, that can kind of make you feel like you're on oxygen overload and can cause some strange sensations. Eventually those will go away and they're actually a positive thing uh, because you're getting more oxygen throughout your body. Um, lack of concentration. So uh, nicotine is uh, a stimulant and can almost act like ADHD medication. So sometimes when you quit smoking, you can feel a little foggy, you can feel like you're having trouble focusing uh, because you no longer have that stimulant introduced to your system. Um, coffee, coughing and stuffy nose, so quitting smoking, your, your body starts to sort of clean out your uh, respiratory system and it can just make you feel like you have a cold uh, because it's trying to get everything out of there. 
Increased appetite and weight gain is again a result of the stimulant effect of, of smoking. So it is an appetite suppressant. So when you stop smoking, you might notice that you have an increased appetite. Also food starts to taste better uh, after you quit. And so, it, um, and you know, not having anything to do with your hands, you may do some mindless eating. So just being mindful of that can, uh, can help with that. And that's certainly not an exhaustive list of withdrawal symptoms, but those are some of the most common. Um, so some of the things we recommend to help with breaking the habit, of course, I already talked about drinking water. I mean, having like a big container of water with you all the time, carrying some low calorie food items. So you can kind of get that hand to mouth action that you might be missing. So things like, um, we always talk about like frozen grapes is a really good one. Um, pretzel sticks or popcorn, um, fruits and vegetables of any kind. Uh, things that you can kind of eat a lot of without a um, potential weight gain are usually a better choice to have around than, uh, you know, a bag of Oreos or something like that, where you might have a tendency to overeat on something like that. Um, trying to be more active, so setting goals for physical activity. We know activity definitely decreases cravings and giving yourself another goal to focus on, something like having a pedometer and trying to get 10,000 steps a day can help reduce those cravings, but also shift your focus to something else. Um, the deep breathing, whenever those uh, cravings come on, using those four Ds we talked about, and then working to avoid some of your trigger situations. So if you have a group of friends that always get together and maybe they're smoking um, is part of the ritual, not attending some of those for a short period of time until you get more comfortable uh, being around people who smoke when you are trying to quit um, is a good idea. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people do with cigarettes is, you know, they get into a stressful situation and they're, you know, they have those feelings of, uh, gosh, I really need a cigarette and feeling like because when you smoke, you initially get those feelings of euphoria. It can feel like it's taken away your stress. But actually the research shows that being a smoker is more stressful than the stress relief provided by actually smoking because your body's sensitivity to stress might be heightened and you're more likely to try to go back to a cigarette to, to deal with that. So finding different ways to deal with your stress is really important when you're quitting smoking because you will encounter stressful situations and those will be times when your body is telling you have a cigarette. What are some other things you could do? Um, going for a walk or getting some physical activity definitely helps to relieve stress. Um, performing some relaxation exercises. So this could be um, some visualization or some progressive muscle relaxation, maybe yoga, listening to relaxing music and deep breathing. Um, can all be helpful. Um, using more constructive thinking, so um, positive self-talk and um, having more assertive behavior can all also be beneficial when you're to help reduce the amount of stress you have. So weight gain is a major issue when people go to quit smoking, and a lot of times if people start going gaining weight, they will go back to smoking in order to uh, lose that weight again. Um, the main reasons why people gain weight when they quit is because there's a slight decrease in metabolism. So um, you burn more calories as a smoker than a non-smoker, at least initially. Um, but it's not a significant slowdown, um, not so much that accounts for some of the major weight gain that some people see. The biggest thing is probably substituting food for cigarettes and eating out of boredom. So um, the time that you spent smoking may now be more, you might be more likely to um, try to grab something to eat for that. Also, um, the, I talked a little bit about the fact that food usually, um, your, your sense of smell and taste will improve shortly after you quit and may make you more inclined to eat more food. So um, important to watch portion sizes and really keeping healthy foods on hand. So that out of sight, out of mind, if you, um, you know, have, a bag of frozen grapes or a, a little bag of pretzels as your go-to rather than having, you know, a bag of chips or, or cookies or a pizza on hand. 
um, that could be really beneficial. And then trying to get a little bit more physical activity, and this will definitely help combat that decrease in metabolism, especially if you haven't been overly active, um, that physical activity can be really beneficial. So some of the benefits of quitting, um, they start almost immediately. So 20 minutes after you quit smoking, your blood pressure and your body temperature return back to normal. Within about eight hours, your carbon monoxide levels will drop back to normal. So you'll be working on um, better levels of oxygen. And within 24 hours, your chance of a heart attack decreases. So every time you smoke a cigarette it actually causes your blood vessels to narrow. So um, that if you had uh, already had developed a little bit of blockage in your arteries and you acutely smoke, that can make that opening even more narrow. So if you had uh, maybe a small blood clot that was trying to go through, it could get lodged in there. And so as soon as you quit, you already reduce your chances of that happening because your blood vessels will open up wider. Within two weeks to three months, your circulation improves and your lung function can increase up to 30%. So although um, emphysema and other um, lung diseases related to smoking are not reversible, um, you can improve your lung function through other means and also the increase in oxygenation and circulation uh, can be beneficial to your breathing. In one to nine months, coughing and sinus congestion and fatigue decrease and your cilia will regain their normal function. So it, it takes a while, but there's a process here where your lungs are cleaning themselves out and um, you, you can see improvements in their functioning and how you feel. Um, in the more long-term benefits, um, within one year, your excess risk of coronary artery disease is half that of a smoker's. So you've already helped to improve um, your blood vessels. Within five years, your stroke risk is reduced to that of a smoker's five to 15 years after quitting. In 10 years, your lung cancer death rate is half that of a smoker um, and risk of all cancers decrease. And in 15 years, your risk of heart disease is the same as a non-smoker. So it's never too late to quit. There's all sorts of benefits that can be um, had by um, quitting at any age. So one of the biggest uh, factors that is, can make uh, the whole process really difficult is relapse and that many people do quit smoking and go back to it. And in fact, we know that the average person will try to quit about six to eight times before they're successful. And so uh, tenacity is super important here and um, kind of thinking about what, what factors do contribute to, to relapse. So um, ensuring that you stay quit is planning ahead for your response to a crisis. So um, even if you've been quit for a little while, if you come under a situation that is extremely difficult, um, that could be likely a time when you would go back to, um, to smoking. You know, if you were in a fender bender or you got bad news about a loved one or um, news about a health issue, um, that is a trigger that causes a lot of people to go back to smoking. So thinking about if this were to happen, you know, how would you face this crisis without having a cigarette? Um, Another important factor is that if we avoid one cigarette, we avoid all the rest. So we talked about those nicotine receptors at the beginning of the presentation. And those receptors, once they develop on your brain from smoking, they never go away. But what happens is that they do go dormant. So they sort of go to sleep if they aren't getting fed any nicotine. You know, you've overcome that initial phase of them sending the signals and you not responding to them. Eventually they'll kind of go dormant but they are still there. And so when we go you know, into a situation where maybe we're like, oh, I'll just have one cigarette. Well, that one cigarette um, is the catalyst that wakes up all of those nicotine receptors. So you had successfully kind of put them all to sleep, but you have that one cigarette for one reason or another. And all of a sudden it's like ringing the dinner bell for those nicotine receptors. And once they're awake, they tend to, um, they're gonna start sending those signals again. So, you know, we've seen situations where somebody's been quit for a year or five years, and for some reason they decide to have a cigarette, 
Maybe they even cough, they feel a little lightheaded and are kind of like, oh, why did I do that? And then a few hours later, they start having those feelings again of have a cigarette, have a cigarette. And it is because those nicotine receptors are now awake. So that's why we say avoid one cigarette and you avoid all the rest. So as long as you can keep those nicotine receptors sleeping, um, you won't have, uh, have to deal with um, starting up that habit again. Um, dealing with obstacles and barriers with things other than smoking, and then continuing to focus on those long-term benefits. So, you know, feeling better, having more energy, you know, thinking about how much money you saved um, and how your health is improving each and every day that you don't smoke. I had a couple in one of my tobacco cessation classes um, a few years back who um, they were quitting smoking together. He smoked two packs a day and she smoked one. And they took, um, for every pack, they, they made it $5 per pack. They took $5, they put it into a jar together. So she would put $5 in every day and he would put 10 in. And um, after six months, they had enough money to take um, a, you know, a trip to Las Vegas that they've always wanted to do together. And so they kind of set their eye on the prize. They saved up all that money and they were able to take a cool vacation. So I thought that was a, a really good way to help stay motivated. Um, here's just a few uh, resources um, that you can use. We do offer the um, Give It Up Tobacco Cessation Program here at Altman. Um, and I know a lot of, there's a lot of apps out there. This is just a few that you can use. Um, so if you don't want to attend a class, you want to try to do it more on your own, but maybe join um, a group of people who are also quitting and have some motivators. These are a few of, of the apps that are out there, but obviously you can just Google or uh, search in the app store for quit smoking. There's a lot of different options and you can see what people are using to help them quit. Um, Altman's Tobacco Cessation Program meets uh, usually there's one or two classes offered every month led by a tobacco treatment specialist. They meet one for once a week for six weeks, one hour at a time. Um, it's group counseling with a tobacco treatment specialist, you know, working through some of the barriers that we talked about, having somebody to bounce ideas off of and work with and give you advice and helping the help of other people who also may be going through the same thing as you. Um, we encourage you to register online for those at altman.org backslash give it up. The classes are listed on there. You can just pick which one you want, and then someone will contact you based on um, the class that you've chosen. You can also call, and we can assist you if you don't have a computer, um, but we do all the registrations through um, online. We also offer uh, virtual tobacco cessation classes, so you could do it from a computer or a smartphone. Um, from the convenience of your own home. And those are listed on the website as well. 